As you're standing, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to read this chapter all together this morning. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts, then each one's praise will come from God. Verse 6. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You are already full. You are already rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I could wish you did reign that we also might reign with you. But I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men contemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things until now. I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you may have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Now some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and a spirit of gentleness? We are continuing in... Uh, 1 Corinthians, and today as we look at chapter 4, I want to talk to you about three hats we wear, or three roles, or three uh, names that, that describe us as we uh, walk with the Lord and as we are his disciples. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about stewards, fools, and sons. Now you might be wondering, can, can I be one of these? Do I have to be all three? Um, nobody really wants to be a fool, right? But we are going to look at God's word and each of these roles and some aspects of character and responsibility of these roles as described in uh, God's word. And I believe we will find ourselves in the scripture here this morning and we will realize what God expects of our lives and how he wants to shape our character as we journey on with him. So the first five verses uh, talk about Paul as a steward. And so we're looking at the role of a steward here. And as we read these uh, verses, we see Paul is describing himself and he's calling himself uh, a steward. And a steward is really a servant, but kind of an elevated servant, because not only are you given a lot of responsibilities, but you are entrusted with something that does not belong to you, but you're in, entrusted with it, and you are expected to look after it as if it belongs to you. Uh, sometimes we are very careful 
to knock off lights and fans in our own houses, especially these days. But when we go out, we are not too concerned about uh, knocking off lights and fans and conserving electricity uh, because we don't own that bill. That bill is not coming to us. Uh, so we are careful to steward that which belongs to us, but sometimes we are not very careful to steward that which we don't own. But here Paul is talking about being a steward of something that is not yours, but looking after it with the responsibility and with the faithfulness as if it was your own. And that is what uh, in the Old Testament we find Joseph had that responsibility. He was entrusted with all that was in Potiphar's household and he was to look after it as, it as if it was his own. But here in verse 2 it says, moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. So faithfulness is the primary characteristic uh, or the primary quality required of a steward. And here we see that as Paul had been entrusted and as we are also entrusted, we are all, not just Paul, but we are all stewards of the message of the gospel and we are also stewards of this ministry, this unique ministry that God has entrusted to each and every one of us. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior, then you have received the message of the gospel, amen? That receiving of the message is what transformed your life. But now you have, you have received this message and you have been entrusted with it and you are called to guard it and share it and steward it. And at the same time, as we, as we know that as we walk with the Lord, we cannot just be, um, you know, uh, idle, but we are each and every one of us called and equipped and, and in, entrusted with some kind of ministry. And we are called by God to, to guard that ministry, to look after it, to foster it, to nurture it, to be true to it. And as this steward's quality was mentioned, to be faithful, to, uh, uh, to do it well. And you know, as a, uh, as a person who knows the Lord, it doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are, whatever age or stage of life you are at, God can entrust you with a message and a ministry and give you a, a, a forum and an opportunity in which you can be a steward. Even if you're a school-going child here this morning, uh, God is not overlooking you. God is not passing you over. Even if at your young age you, you know the Lord Jesus, you have that message in you and you are a steward of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you are called to be a faithful steward of that message wherever you are. And at the same time, God calls and equips us and entrusts us with ministries also at different stages of our lives. And there is no one age or stage that we come to where God says, okay, now you're old enough. I have seen even little children uh, being entrusted with a ministry by the Lord and, and being released to do what God has called them to do. And now more than ever, it is important for us to understand that God is calling and equipping young people and children, and they are being entrusted as stewards with ministries that God wants them to fulfill. And as a church, we are, we are to rally around, we are to support, we are to recognize, we are to encourage, and we are to model to them how to serve God. We have to be good models on faithfulness. We have to be good models on character. We have to be good models on how you diligently serve God in the ministry that he has entrusted to you, not in a haphazard way, not in a lackadaisical, a complacent sort of way, but in a, in a way where you prioritize that which God has entrusted with you. And here it kind of seems like Paul is speaking a bit arrogantly in verse 3 where he says, 
it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself, for I know of nothing against myself. And when you read this, you kind of think, wow, Paul, did you, did you think you were perfect? Did you think that you were not messing up in any area? But here it's, it's reminding us that there is a difference between walking blamelessly before the Lord and still falling in certain areas from time to time because we are human beings. There's a difference in that. And intentionally having a lifestyle which in certain areas dishonors God and goes against his word and areas in which we are not willing to bend, we are not willing to change, we are not willing to be cleansed. And then we are telling people, don't judge me, let God be my judge. Why was Paul able to say this confidently? Because when he examined himself and when he looked at himself, he realized that he has nothing in him that is intentionally going against the ways of God. So as a steward, we are called to be blamelessly walking with the Lord. Blamelessly walking with the Lord and for that, uh, we need to judge ourselves, and that's why Paul says, you know, I know of nothing against myself. How did Paul know of nothing against himself? Because he looked inward. That's why Paul was able to confidently say that he knew there was nothing inside him that was um, intentionally displeasing to the Lord. And he urges us in verse 5, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart, and everyone's praise will come from God. So here Paul is cautioning us, even as stewards, as fellow stewards, not to prematurely and sometimes unfairly um, look at the lives of other people and pass judgment over them but to remember that God is the ultimate judge. And I think that this is something that we need to continuously remind ourselves of because if we keep that in, in the front of our mind, we will be a little less harsh and malicious and offensive towards other people and a little bit more concerned about the answer that we have to give to the Lord when we see him face to face. Because that indeed is the burning question. When we, we may bring all these accusations and judgments before the Lord about other people continuously, but it is pertinent to remind ourselves that on that day when we see him face to face, he is going to talk to me about me. And he's going to talk to you about you. And so we need to be a little bit more concerned about what kind of an answer we are going to give to God about the message and the ministry that he has entrusted to us. But often we are very caught up about the message and ministry that God has given to other people. And many times we even use that as a distraction to, to just distract from inward consideration of our own lives. So we don't think about where we are erring, but we concentrate a lot on where others are erring. Now there is a place for discernment. There is a place for judgment in the body of Christ. There is a place for all those things. But here in this passage, Paul is talking about our role as stewards and how we will have to give account to God for the message and the ministry that he has entrusted to us and I pray that each and every one of you seated here this morning will be able to boldly and confidently stand before the Lord one day and say, I was faithful to that which you entrusted to me, Lord. Isn't that your prayer? That's our prayer, that is our desire. But I also sense that many times we are not really aware of that which God has entrusted to us, especially where our ministries are concerned. We tend to limit it to things which are done here or sometimes things which are done even within these four walls. And we don't realize that to many of us, God has given this primary ministry that is happening in our homes. 
and uh, which has to happen in our homes, where in our homes we have to be stewards of the message. But many of us, and I speak to myself and to all parents here this morning, that um, sometimes we are not paying attention to the gold mind that is right under our nose and all that God has told us to do and to model and to be and to teach and to steward in our own homes. And instead, we are watching distractedly, we are watching complacently, or we are watching our screen while the enemy plunders those who are in our home. Perhaps as parents, on many levels, we have not understood our responsibilities as spiritual stewards in our homes. And I pray that God will speak to us this morning and bring conviction into all of our hearts. Moving on in verse 6, Paul talks about being a fool. And here, he makes a, a differentiation between himself and Apollos um, and the rest of the Corinthians. And this is these few verses, we see a kind of uh, Paul's kind of sarcastic way of talking to the Corinthian church. And he has identified that they are puffed up with pride. They really think highly of themselves. They are very proud about where they have come in life, who they are, what they have achieved, uh, what they have done, what they have. And he speaks very pointedly uh, to them. And he says in verse 7, what makes you differ from another? What do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? And he speaks to their pride about you know, their, their, their exalted opinions of what they had and who they were. And many times we are like that as well. We are very puffed up about who we are, where we come from, what we have, what we can do. And we need a reality to check. We need somebody to tell us, what do you have that God didn't give you? Who are you that God didn't give you the skill and the ability to make that? We need a reminder that who we are and everything we have is God's abundant blessing upon our lives. And it's nothing to do with what we have achieved and what we deserve to be in this life. And as Paul goes on, he contrasts the pride and the arrogance of the Corinthian believers with what he was going through. Uh, and he very clearly differentiates between these two groups. And he shows that they were, uh, Paul and Apollos were instead being humiliated, being dragged to the mud, he gives a picture of, of them, uh, a picture that these Corinthians understood, like being in the Colosseum and the wild animals attacking you while a crowd jeers you on, being made a spectacle of, and being humbled and condemned and um, really humiliated. And then in verse 10 he says, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ, we are weak, but you are strong, you are distinguished, but we are dishonored. And he goes on to describe the ways in which he and Apollos as servants of God were walking a humble road which was in stark contrast to the Corinthians' pride and arrogance. And what he's highlighting here is the humility that we are required to have as we walk this Christian road and the fact that we are all called to be fools for Christ. It's difficult to accept these words, I know. But the truth is that the true Christian life, the one that is closest to the Bible, is a lifetime or, at the very least, certain seasons of humbling and not exaltation. The Corinthians were very proud in their exalted state, and they thought that that was the picture of a successful Christian. 
But Paul was showing them a completely different way. And that way is the way of humility because we are called to be fools for Christ. And how does this translate into our practical living? Nobody wants to be a fool, right? Maybe when I told you the topic for this morning, you were thinking that, uh, uh, you know, the fool is, not, is what we are not supposed to be. Because the book of Proverbs talks about fool in a completely different light. So many of you may have been banking on that. But here, we are called to be fools for Christ in many ways when we live out Christianity or discipleship according to the Bible. Sometimes you have to make efforts towards peace and reconciliation with another person. Those are humbling experiences. Who likes having to apologize to someone who is beneath you? None of us. Some of us have a hard time apologizing even to someone who is over us. Sometimes being a fool for Christ means we have to turn down certain privileges, opportunities, exalted positions, because deep inside you know that that is not what God had planned for you. Not that it is bad, but inside of you, in that instance, you know that that's not what God has planned for you. And in that process, it's a very humbling thing for you, and you may be looked down upon by others around you. Sometimes we have to, for the sake of Christ, suffer insults, be put down by people. And in those moments, we will be required to be silently godly, even though deep inside of you, the chandia wants to rise up and show them <laughs> what you can do. And this kind of a concept is especially hard in our culture because in our culture especially, shame and embarrassment is very hard to bear up and we will do everything we can to avoid it at all costs, sometimes even denying Christ, just to avoid shame and embarrassment. And it's compounded because all over the world, we are fed a gospel that says that you don't have to go through these things. You don't have to be humbled. You can just be an exalted person or you can, you know, be the head always. But there's one small problem with that kind of a gospel and that problem is the life of Jesus because he shows us a completely different way and he calls us to walk a completely different path so we can follow things that we hear which may taste nice to us, but that's not the gospel. That's not what the Bible says. And so it's an uncomfortable encouragement to us this morning to realize that following Christ sometimes be, means being a fool for Christ. But I want you to understand being a fool for Christ. Don't just be a fool. Because there are sometimes that we do foolish things that have nothing to do with the gospel. And then when we are shamed and we are humbled and we are mocked, we try to hide behind scripture verses like this. Please don't twist scripture to your own benefit. Know the word and learn to differentiate between those moments where you're tempted to be a fool and those moments where God is really calling you to be a fool for Christ. Finally, Paul talks about being a son and him being a father from verse 14 down to verse 21. Up to this point, Paul has been very firm and kind of uh, strict with this um, congregation, really speaking very directly to their pride and arrogance. But here in verse 14, he changes his tone a little bit, but yet he's very direct. He says, I don't write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. 
And so we see Paul's fatherly heart, Paul's pastoral heart coming out here, even though he had to tell something to the Corinthians that they did not like to hear. And he goes on to establish that he's warning them and he's correcting them, not because he's forcing his authority upon them, but because he has a relationship with them that has come out of leading them to Christ, shepherding them, teaching them the ways of God, and living among them in an exemplary way. See, now more than ever, we cannot force authority. But it was beneficial to the Corinthian believers to relate to Paul as a father figure. They may not have liked it. They certainly didn't like it. But it was beneficial to them and their Christian walk for them to relate to him in that manner because we all need people to look up to. We all need people to follow. And we all need people who can correct us. And so he was talking to the Corinthians as his sons and daughters. And uh, what I sensed the Lord was really wanting to impress upon our hearts today is that we are all sons and daughters. And correction is a very important part of our own character development. And if we take this stance in life that nobody can correct us, then we lose out. And uh, just a very cursory glance through the book of Proverbs, um, we will find in many, many places the value of correction and uh, you know what really happens to us when we are um, stubborn and obstinate and refuse to take correction uh, from those whom God has placed around us. Um, turn with me, I just turned to a couple of scriptures, but turn with me to Proverbs chapter 3, and let's read verse 11 and 12. It says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Uh, you know, the problem with this verse is uh, that Many of us don't despise the chastening of the Lord. But we despise the vessel that the Lord uses to chasten us. Right? Very often, uh, God is not going to chasten us with audible voice from heaven. God is not going to, you know, speak to us in that way directly and chasten us. But many times, to our great discomfort and embarrassment, God chooses to use other flawed people <laughs> to be vessels of his chastening in our lives. But it says here that whom the Lord loves, he corrects. And it is we who lose out when we don't want to accept the chastening because we don't like the vessel or we don't like the fact that God is using somebody else. And you know, we can, uh, there are so many verses in, in Proverbs, you can just look up the word correction or chastening uh, and you will find all these things that, you know, those who refuse correction will one day suddenly be destroyed. And I've seen that uh, happen when there are certain things in our lives for which we know we are doing the wrong thing, particularly when there are certain impurities in our lives and we deaden ourselves to the voice of God and we don't listen to those who correct us. And sometimes when people uh, correct us once or twice and we have not obeyed, that person becomes detestable to us because we are not doing what they told us. So every time we see them, we realize I, I have not put that area right. I don't want to put that area right. So the only thing, so I, since I don't want the sin to get out, let the person get out. So because of that, sometimes we distance ourselves from certain people. Some people, even if they are corrected in a cell environment and they are not happy, they will leave the cell. And the best part is they will never say, I was corrected and I got angry and that's why I left the cell. No, that leader doesn't share the word properly. 
So I left that cell. Maybe people are happy to be in places where they are never corrected, but that's not biblical community. That's not church, according to the Bible. According to the Bible, we grow together, and we speak the word of God to one another, and we grow with one another, and, and, and that's just how it has to be. So we are in a family, we are in a community, and we are called by God to be as guards among one another and, and you know, let the word of God be spoken over one another in love, even as Paul said, my beloved children. He, he came to them in love. And so chastening in love can be a great thing to build up and purify and cleanse our lives. But as Proverbs says, God doesn't keep on going after us if we do not heed the many vessels that he sends to us uh, to show his chastening and to expose things in our lives. There is a time when we will be suddenly destroyed without remedy. And you may be coasting along thinking, nobody is holding me to book. Even God is not. In fact, he's blessing me in my job. He's blessing me in everything. So God must be happy with what I'm doing. I tell you, you're, you're, you couldn't be further from the truth. God is letting you be, but there will be a time when his mercy has just come to its brim with you and your situation. So don't despise the chastening of the Lord. Don't despise those who God places around you. Don't get easily offended but learn to be a true son and a daughter in the kingdom and a true son and daughter in the community of believers. And maybe as new believers also, we, we give a little grace period for us to be corrected. But as we you know, begin to mature in our faith or in our years in the Lord and our years in the church or our positions in ministry, it's very, very easy to come to a place of not allowing anybody to speak into our lives. And especially if we are, you know, holding places of authority or responsibility in our secular jobs or in society, we are not used to people holding us uh, to account or speaking truths into our lives about areas which we need to correct, especially in cultures like this, because nobody will dare to do it. If you are the boss, even if you are doing something wrong, nobody is going to come and tell it to you. So if you are unknowingly doing certain wrong things, you will be continuing in your blindness because no one around you will have the guts to come and tell this to your face, to your own detriment, right? And it is the same detriment in our spiritual life. Um, if we are so proud and so arrogant and think we are beyond reproach, and if we display an unteachable attitude, then you will find that even when people want to correct you in love, they will not correct you because your very manner has shown that you are not open to correction. That's the truth. And so, as we end this chapter this morning, I just want you to think for a minute, when was the last time that you stood corrected by somebody? Think about it. When was the last time that somebody in love shared something with you which must have taken a lot of strength and boldness on their part? How did you receive it? Did you get angry? Did you yell at them? Did you block them from social media? Did you badmouth them to others? And don't sit here like saints. These are things that happen all the time. <laughs> or even though you were slightly embarrassed and had a tinge of something inside of you, did you accept it and at least try to put it right? None of us are going to be perfect this side of heaven. But we can grow more and more into his image day by day. And that is the power of the cross. That's why there's a redeemer, because we cannot do this on our own. Let's look to the Lord in prayer.
Father, we just bring our lives before you today. And you know, Lord, how this word is relevant to each and every one of us. You know those areas where we have not understood our roles as stewards. Give us a greater awareness this morning, Lord, and the willingness to take up that which you have entrusted to us and to be faithful with it. Especially lift up parents and those in authority uh, this morning. I pray, Lord, for your wisdom upon each and every one of us because we cannot do this in our own wisdom or in our own authority or in our own knowledge or our own experience. We cannot do any of it alone. But we need your grace, we need your strength, we need your insight, Lord. And we need you to help us to be faithful, to steward that which you have entrusted to us. Whether we are young or old this morning, I pray that you will enable us by your grace to be faithful stewards, Lord, of the message and the ministry that you have given undeservedly, but so graciously to each and every one of us. Lord, for those of us who struggle with becoming a fool for Christ and who even at this moment see that there are certain areas in our lives which particularly you have to break down our pride and our arrogance, Lord, soften our hearts. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to be sons and daughters who are willing to be corrected so that our lives can please you more each day. Especially, I pray, Lord, for those here this morning who don't understand the concept of being a son or a daughter and who feel like they are totally alone and abandoned. Father God, I lift up each person who is having those kinds of feelings here this morning, and I pray that your care, your fatherly love will be lavished upon them in a mighty way, even right now, Lord. We are not orphans. You have not left us alone. You have not abandoned us, even though we may have suffered uh, at the hands of our earthly families. I thank you that we are your sons and daughters, and you are forever our Abba Father. Amen. Hallelujah. You are forever our Abba Father, and what a good father you are, a good, good father, a loving father. But you love us so much that you need to correct us. You need to shape us. And I pray that all our negative experiences will not block your work in our lives when you choose to chasten us and when you choose to build us up, Lord. And help us not to be offensive. Help us not to be offended. Help us not to get easily angered. But help us to love and appreciate those you have placed around us, even in this community knowing that though sometimes they may be rough on the edges, the correction and the chastening comes with love and care. Thank you that you are our Redeemer. Thank you that in every weak area of our lives you are strong. Thank you that you shed your blood for the remission of our sins, and to rescue us and to give us a hope and a future even in this life. And so with hearts of gratitude, we just worship you and bless you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. First Corinthians chapter 11 says, Verse 23, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take it, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death 
till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. When we share the Holy Communion together, we are reminding ourselves that we were once sinners, we were once condemned to death. But Jesus, because of his love, came down to earth, took our sins upon his perfect self, and paid the price for the sins of all humanity, past, present, and future. He took it all upon him, and he died on that cruel cross, and he rose again. But because of his death and his resurrection, we have salvation. We are restored into fellowship with the Father. And we share these um, elements together as a body of believers here this morning so that we would be continuously reminded that salvation is free but not cheap and that grace can never be taken for granted because we were bought with a price. And so the, the, the cup represents to us his blood which was shed because he loves you and he loves me. And the bread represents his body which was broken so that we will be made whole. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior, even if it is your first time here today, if you are confident that you are walking with Jesus, you are invited to partake of these elements as they are passed around. But if you do not understand what it means to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, or if you are not there yet, you have not taken that step, please refrain and let the elements be passed over because we are also called to examine ourselves and ensure that we don't partake in an unworthy manner and then bring God's judgment on us. Even as we pray now, let us lift up a heart of gratitude and thanksgiving to the Lord. And let us also be reminded that he died also for our sicknesses, both of the mind and of the body. And if you need healing this morning, or if you know of someone who needs healing this morning, let us cry out to the Lord and let us believe that Jehovah Rapha is here in our midst this morning and he's able to touch us and heal us of every bodily infirmity and of every emotional scar which needs his healing touch. Let's pray. Father God, we just want to thank you that we have this opportunity to gather together and to partake of these elements and in so doing, remind ourselves once again of the great price that you paid for us. Just want to thank you, Lord, that while we were yet sinners, you loved us. We want to thank you that your love knows no bounds and your love reaches even to the worst areas, the shameful, sinful areas of our lives, which are redeemable because you shed your blood. And so we lift up a heart of gratitude this morning and we thank you for every stripe you bore, for every insult you bore, for every day on which you walked on this cruel earth. Because when we look at your life and your death and resurrection, we are reminded of how much you love us and that you will love us till the very end. And we thank you for that, Lord. And this morning we pray that you will cleanse us of every impurity in our lives. Help us to examine ourselves and put our lives right as only we can do. Help us not to be blind to our sin. Help us not to be dead or obstinate or stubborn in our sin but soften our hearts this morning that we would be open before you and allow you to cleanse us and wash us clean. And we also thank you that you are a healing God. And we thank you that your healing power is flowing through this sanctuary at this very moment. And all those who are sick in their body and all those who need healing of the mind, your blood is enough. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Lord, just heal us and touch us and restore us this morning. And even as we partake, I pray that you'll give us a fresh encounter with you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We can never be grateful enough for what the Lord has done. We can never be grateful and thankful enough for His grace in our lives, for the forgiveness of sins. That's why the Apostle Paul, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gift of salvation, says, Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. There are no words that can describe the gift that God has given. And there is no way that we can repay Him enough. But there is one thing we can do. One thing that pleases His heart. And that is to be a witness and a bearer not only of his message by our words and by our lives in the home, in the marketplace and wherever God calls us to be. And when you bear the word of the Lord in those places, sometimes you will feel pain. And that's just an inkling of what Jesus went through. I don't think you can even compare it enough, but it is some reflection of what Jesus went through for us. May God give every one of us grace to be true to Him wherever He has placed us every day of the coming week and thereafter. And now with the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.